Hello again, this is video two for week number three, and this is what I call a new nation. This is the after effects of the revolution. And the early frameworks for governing really start with the state government. The state government start to form before the Revolutionary War ends. Constitutions begin to be written down. And the people really dislike unwritten constitutions. They can't be trusted. The Constitution of Great Britain is largely unwritten, and so people were really, really worried about it. To draft the Constitution, the states are going to call conventions, and most of these leading citizens of these states are going to come and they're going to talk about what they want the government to look like. Most states are going to have a very similar structure. There's going to be a strong legislature. It's usually going to have two houses. There's going to be a weak governor, uh, typically elected by the legislature and not by the people. And then there's going to be an independent judiciary. More people are given the right to vote, uh, the property qualifications are lowered, and then there are going to be limits on government authority, uh, similar to the Bill of Rights. Freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the right to a fair trial, the right to protection against searches, and the consent to taxation. Now the problem with this first system is that the weak executive branch meant that Everything was really slow. The legislature had to act first. And as we know from our current political landscape, legislatures have a really hard time agreeing on anything. When it became obvious that the executives couldn't really work well, the governor's power was gradually increased. In fact, many state constitutions are rewritten during the 1780s and 1790s once the states realized that the original constitution didn't work. So the system of checks and balances that we know today come into place because of the weak executive and the slow legislature process. Our first national government was actually called the Articles of Confederation, and it was drafted in 1777 by the uh, Second Continental Congress. This created a national government that had a unicameral or one house legislature. There was one representative from each of the 13 colonies. There was absolutely no executive branch. And the United States was more of a league of nations called the United States of America, emphasis on the state. Today, we are a nation made up of states, but back then, there were individual states, little individual countries that worked together to form a confederation. So each state remains sovereign. Any powers not specifically delegated to the National Congress remain with the state. Uh, in other words, we were very much more like the European Union than what we are today. The powers actually given to the national government were limited. I have pretty much all of them listed here. The national government could settle disputes between states, it could regulate foreign affairs, it could set the value of coin, and it could not raise money or raise taxes at all. Now, if that's not bad enough, there's absolutely no power to enforce its decisions upon the states. So the Articles of Confederation were purposely weak. Uh, even though they were written in 1777, they didn't even go into effect until 1780 because Maryland refused to sign on because it disagreed with how Western lands were distributed. So the weaknesses of the articles became very obvious very quickly. Uh, foreign trade, foreign relations, each state went their own way. Uh, there were major problems with Britain embargo trade between the states. Some states were more friendly with Britain than others. And each state also pursued its own policy when it came to Native Americans. So there were a lot of wars that weren't settled until 1795. 
Now there was one success, and that's really the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Now the Northwest Territory is what the Northwest Ordinance governed, and the Northwest Territory was the land bordered by the Mississippi River to the west, the Ohio River to the south, and the Great Lakes to the north. The Northwest Ordinance specifically prohibited slavery in that territory, and the people living in the Northwest Ordinance or the Northwest Territory were specifically given a bill of rights, the right to a jury trial, freedom of religion, and the right for a new state to join the Union and be equal to all the older states. And what that meant is Delaware is qualified or considered the first state. It was the first one to sign on to everything. And if Puerto Rico or Washington, D.C. ever become a state, they will have the same standing, the same credibility, the same rank, if you will, as the first state of Delaware. The Northwest Ordinance also laid out townships and how taxes would be done and even education districts. Now in 1786, Representatives from five states are going to meet in Maryland to discuss problems with the way the trade policy worked out. And remember, you have to have a 100% vote to get anything done under the Articles of Confederation. Everybody has to agree. So the fact that five states came together in 1786, basically useless. Because of that, the meeting is dismissed and calls are put out for a new constitutional convention to be held in 1787. Uh, letters are sent to each of the 13 states and replies don't come very quickly at all. At the same time that this is happening, the economy in Massachusetts is going really fast. Uh, farmers are being asked to pay back their debts using coin currency, which is something that they just don't have. So many farmers are asking for relief through the issuing of paper money. Paper money could be issued easier. Well, creditors are asking for paper money to be banned. And on top of that, you have heavy taxes in Massachusetts to try and pay off all the war debt. So 1786, the state refuses to issue paper money people in three western counties revolt. And by the time we get to January 1787, there are 1,200 farmers led by a man named Daniel Shea who are going to attack the Springfield Arsenal, which is where the weapons were held. Now the farmers are going to be easily defeated, but this rumor of rebellion is going to scare the pants off people. And before you know it, February of 1787, with when the next meeting happens, all states except for one are there to discuss modifying the Articles of Confederation. And this becomes known as the Constitutional Convention. And it's really interesting because 12 out of 13 states send a delegate. And to do anything underneath the Articles of Confederation, all 13 states have to be represented. And they start out the meeting by throwing out that rule. They work outside the rules, so to speak. They basically, you know, break their own laws. They decide 12 states are enough. We will go ahead and do some work. And so the 55 delegates that are there sit down to figure out what are we going to do? It's decided by these 55 delegates, most of whom are wealthy, elite, uh, young to middle-aged men, that we need to be some form of republic. And there are questions, should we be a Greek republic? Well, no, because Greek republics are only good if you're small in size, and in many ways, Greek republics actually fail. Should we be a republic based on self-interest? Well, yeah, everybody should have self-interest. Everybody should want to improve their economic and social circumstances. But there comes a point where people are going to worry about their private interests more than everybody else. Maybe we need to do something different. And then there's the egalitarian republic they're thinking about. Why don't we be a government that represents all the people? 
and let's have widespread participation. Well, it ends up that they take a little bit from all three of these to create something new. And there are going to be two different plans that are put together. Uh, most of the work is done by 12 men. And those 12 men are going to come up with the Virginia plan and the Northern New Jersey plan. The Virginia plan was probably written by James Madison, but it was presented by Governor Edmund Randolph of Virginia. It calls officially for a republic to be the form of government. It calls for a bicameral legislature. One house will be voted by the people. The other will be voted by the first one. So you will vote for your House of Representatives, and then the House of Representatives will choose the Congress. Or the, uh, the senators, I should say. Altogether, the House and the Senate will vote for an, a, an executive, and then there will be a national judiciary that is separate. Many believe that this Virginia plan would give too much power to the national government because all you're voting for are the representatives, and then the representatives are voting for everything else. But New Jersey, they've got a plan too. They say more or less the Articles of Confederation work fine. Let's leave representation equal amongst the states, but let's give Congress more power over trade and let's give Congress more power over taxation. Well, that one's going to be rejected too. And eventually, the representatives from Connecticut are going to come up with a compromise. They're going to say, well, why don't we take the two houses from Virginia, let's elect an executive, but that have, have that executive done by the people, and then let's have equal representation in one part of the legislature. Let's have population base in the other, and this becomes known as the Great Compromise. And the Great Compromise is the system we have today. Now, the Constitution is approved for release in September 1787. Several voted against it. The main question is, what rights do the states have versus what rights does the federal government have? And it's decided that the Constitution will be ratified when nine states approve. So we get this argument. We get federalist versus anti-federalist. We have people who are for the Constitution versus against the Constitution. The Federalists are going to support the Constitution as it's written. The Anti-Federalists are going to want a guaranteed Bill of Rights. The Federalists are going to be the merchants, the bankers, the large farmers. The Anti-Federalists are typically going to be small farmers and frontiersmen. Federalists want a strong central government. The Anti-Federalists want strong state government. And both are going to have some very strong people lead them. You've got James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay on one side, then you have Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry on the other. To convince people that they're right, both sides are going to write a set of essays. The Federalists write the Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalists write the Anti-Federalist Papers, and people make their own decisions here. Eventually, states begin to ratify the Constitution, and by June of 1788, nine out of the 13 states will ratify. This is after Hamilton writes about the evils of factions, Madison writes about how the Republic can work against factions, about how the, the representation works. And the anti-federalists, they just don't have quite as good of an answer for what's happening. And more people are swayed by the federalist argument. Now, there are a couple of states, there are four specifically, that don't sign it. There's North Carolina, Rhode Island, Virginia, and New York. The battle in those states is very, very close. But in the end, both of those are going to ratify the Constitution by the end of 1788, mostly because of the Federalist Papers. 
North Carolina and Rhode Island, they are still going to hold out, though, until the Bill of Rights is passed. And I'll talk about the Bill of Rights in the video for next week. Now, a big question you might have is who gets to participate in this new government? It's going to be white males who own property and pay tax. Poor whites don't have a say. Females don't have a say. African Americans definitely don't have a say. And Native Americans aren't even considered when this government was written. So there's lots of glaring omissions that will have to be solved as we go through time. But more or less, this right here which will set up the system that we still use today in 2021 with a few tweaks in there. All right, I hope you have a good week. Any questions, as always, just send me an email and I will answer as quick as I can. And um, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.